Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's certainly good to have you joining us here today. As you see on the screen, our topic that we're going to be discussing today is the robe of righteousness. So when we think about the robe of righteousness, we think of, um, of someone that is pure and holy and good, like, uh, like Jesus is. Now, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were first created, um, they didn't wear any artificial garments like we do today. Uh, in most of the depictions of the Eden scene, they are without any clothing. Of course, they use very artistic ways to cover things up, but you know it seemed that you know that they aren't wearing any clothes. But that's not really uh, the way that God had created them. They initially were clothed in robes of light, and it was kind of an outpouring of the righteousness that uh, God had had given them. Now, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I have a couple quotes that I think will add to our discussion here today. And it is, um, it is um, found in Patriarchs and Prophets, um, page 45. So in Patriarchs and Prophet, page 45, it says this. As man came forth from the hand of his creator, he was of lofty stature and perfect symmetry. His countenance bore the ruddy tint of health and glowed with the light of life and joy. Adam's height was much greater than of that of men who now inhabit the earth. Eve was somewhat less in stature, yet her form was noble and full of beauty. The sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. And you know, so we find here in um, Patriarchs and Prophets that they did wear a garment of light much like the angels had worn. Now, there's one more quote that I'd like to, um, to give, and it kind of um, gives us more information about the topic we're talking about, this robe of righteousness. In Christ Object Lesson, page 310, it says, the white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in Holy Eden. They had lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affections was given to their heavenly father. Notice this, it says, a beautiful soft light, of the light of God enshrouded the holy pair. So when we think about um, this robe of righteousness, we're thinking, we think about um, what God had given to our parents in the beginning. Now, the robe of light was a manifestation of their righteousness and their holy characters. When Adam sinned, they lost this robe of light because their characters had been corrupted by sin. And so I'm just going to read a few texts in the book of Genesis that kind of, um, that kind of points this out. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, it says, And the eyes of them, them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, the, the reason why I had writ, read this is because I want to show is that this robe that they of light that they had worn really was an outflowing of their character, their, uh, their holy righteousness that God had created them with. So the nakedness that Adam and Eve had felt um, was more than just a physical nakedness. Now, they, they felt this nakedness, and then they attempted to cover themselves by sewing together fig leaves. Um, but what they felt was a nakedness of soul. Their characters had been changed by the loss of faith in God and their open act of rebellion against God. And we find this uh, very fact in uh, a few verses, you know, the very next uh, verses, in verses 8 through 10 of Genesis chapter 3. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees. And you say, well, why did they hide themselves? Verse 9 says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, I've read this verse before, but it really kind of shows is that this nakedness that they felt was not a nakedness, uh, just a physical nakedness. It was a nakedness that went all the way through to their souls. Because when God, when, when the Lord God came before them, 
and was, you know, presenting himself to them. They hid themselves and they were afraid because they said they were naked. But in reality, didn't they sew together fig leaves to cover themselves? So in fact, they weren't really physically completely naked. They were, you know, what they were feeling was this nakedness of soul. And so today we're going to look at this robe of righteousness. And we're going to ask, answer just two basic questions. First, what is it? What is this robe of righteousness? And the second question that we're going to answer is, how can we obtain it? So when we take a look at this robe of righteousness, what is this robe of righteousness? In the Bible, there is only one reference in the King James Version to the phrase robe of righteousness. And it is associated with our salvation, and it really is our, um, was our opening text in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. And if you turn to the book of Isaiah 61, verse 10, this is what it reads. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. You know, but while this is really the, the only actual reference to the to the phrase robe of righteousness um, the idea is throughout you know throughout the whole bible there's a there's a number of references to this idea in psalms and from the prophets from isaiah jesus had talked about it um, but the thing that when we think about this robe of righteousness this robe was a robe of white um, white is the symbol of purity and righteousness in the bible now, when Daniel beheld a vision of the throne of God, and he saw the Ancient of Days was clothed in white. Now, this Ancient of Days is none other than the Father himself. So Dan, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, and, and keep in mind that this was a vision that he had seen. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels of burning fire. And so when we, when we read this verse, you know, we see that the garment that the father was wearing was white as snow. It was like pure white, absolute white. In fact, you know, for, for many of us that live here on Guam, and you know, some of us may not have seen snow other than what you know, we see in pictures or on TV, but um, you might say it was as white as the inside of a coconut, right? Because, you know, the inside of a coconut is just very pure white. It's really beautiful to look at. Now, in the Old Testament, when God had uh, implemented the sacrificial system and he had um, set up the tabernacle that he could uh, be with his people, he gave specific instructions on how the tabernacle was to be uh, constructed. And one of the things that they had used was fine white linen. And the priests, when they, the garments that they wore were a fine white linen that was without spot or wrinkle. Um, and we think about that because this is a symbol of Jesus Christ. You, you remember, as we studied before, that the Lamb of God, that or the Lamb that they were to present, which pointed forward to the coming Messiah, was to be a lamb that is was without spot, without um, you know that it was pure, that it wasn't uh, didn't have any deformities, and it really was symbolizing the righteousness and the holiness of the Son of God. Now, also in the Book of Revelation, um, the Bride of Christ is adorned in white linen. I want you to turn, if you will, to the Book of Revelation, chapter nineteen. Uh, verses 7 and 8. And Sister Marie, if, if you're there, if you're able, uh, could you read Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8? Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. 
and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. Amen. And in the King James Version, it says, fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And so when Jesus came to this earth, he preached about the, the, the kingdom of God. He preached about um, bringing the kingdom of God down here to this earth. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, it says this, and he's speaking of the Beatitudes. Now, the Matthew chapter 5 is the very beginning of the Sermon of the Mount, when he has brought the people together and his disciples, and he's presenting before them uh, the, the, the kingdom of God. And he goes through different verses, blessed are they which do mourn, Right. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be filled. Let me just go ahead and bring that up in my Bible. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, in the, you know, the beginning, it says, um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so he goes through a, a number of verses here and is talking about the, the way that they uh, can become right with God. And one of those steps is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. But then later on in the same chapter, in, in verses 14 through 16, Jesus equates something, you know, with this, um, this righteousness, this character that God is um, promising to give to his people. In verse 14, it says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and giveth, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then in verse 16, he says something here. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so what he is talking about here is that the light that is to shine before the world is manifested in the good works that we do. But it's not just any works or deeds. Only those which glorify our Father in heaven are the deeds that he's talking about. Good works is a manifestation of our characters. So when we are driving down the road and we see someone in need, whatever the case may be, maybe they have a flat tire and it's someone that you is having difficulty, you stop by and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help you? Or if you see someone that needs a little bit of, um, you know, that needs some money on, you know, and the Lord is speaking to you and you help them out with a little bit of money or you give them some food or anything that you do that um, helps someone is, you know, glorifies our Father, which is in heaven. So the answer to the first question, what is the robe of righteousness? The answer is the robe of righteousness is a righteous character. Doing good, not for any, uh, not selfishly so that you can get something back, not so that you can be seen of men like the, like the scribes and Pharisees, but doing right and helping others because that is the right thing to do, because it's something that you inside of you decide that you want to do because Christ is working within you. The good works that, that we do is an outflow of a righteousness that is living within us. And so um, the robe of righteousness is a righteous character. And so the question that we have to ask is then, okay, so if the robe of righteousness is a righteous character, how do I get that character, right? How do I produce those good, those good works? Now, um, you've heard in the Bible, and I think it's in Galatians, where it talks about the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, right? All of these things are wonderful, are, are wonderful attributes. But if you notice, they are fruits. They spring forth from something. And that's what we're going to take a look about at here today. And so when we think about this, how do we get this righteousness? How do we get this robe of righteousness? How do we have this character that is holy and righteous and good? 
Jesus was speaking um, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. And I'd just like us to read this a little bit because uh, I, it really kind of tells us what this is all about. Now, in this verse, you know, it's talking about laying up treasures in heaven. Okay, that's what these verses overall are talking about. But it, it's broken down into three kind of three areas. So the first three verses, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask Brother Romy if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 6 and read verses 19 through 24. I'm sorry, 19 through 21. And then... Um, um, Delene, if you do, you have a Bible. If you if you could read, that would be great. If not, we'll um, we'll go to uh, maybe Sister um, um, Norby if you can read as well. So, verses nineteen through twenty one. Uh, can you repeat again? Matthew six nineteen through twenty one. Nineteen to twenty one. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, for moth and rust that corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where for, for your treasure, where treasure, there will your heart be also. The light of the body. Okay, that, is that's God. right. That, that's um. Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah, through okay, twenty one, yeah. and yeah, okay. uh, sister sister Norby, you can read twenty two and twenty three, but um, you don't have to turn on your microphone because we can hear you through your husband's uh, microphone. Matthew six twenty two and twenty three. Yep. The light of the body is the eye. It therefore thine eye be single. Thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Amen. Thank you. Thank you both of you for, for reading that. And I'll go ahead and uh, I will read verse 24. It says, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, in these three areas, the first part is talking about laying up your uh, treasure in heaven. You know, where rust doth, uh, doth not corrupt, uh, where thieves cannot break in and steal. And at the very end of verse 21, when, when Romy was um, reading that, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart be also. So it's talking about the heart here. And then Jesus kind of uh, kind of switches um, the symbol that he's using now to light. It says the light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. And so if you think about this, we're talking about the robe of righteousness. He's and in the heart really is the center of who we are. It is, the, it is our characters. The light of the body really is, is the eye, but it's talking about our characters as well. If therefore, if our characters be single, meaning focused on Christ, then the, our whole body, everything that we do will shine forth in good works, okay? And then at the end, it's talking about serving two masters. You cannot serve light and darkness. Because it says in verse 23, but if your eye, meaning if your heart, if your character is evil, then the whole body shall be full of darkness, shall be so full of wickedness, okay? Um, and so really, Jesus is revealing to us um, our need here, is that if our heart is pure, if our mind is pure, if our characters are pure, then what will come forth from it will be pure deeds of righteousness. Now, in these verses, he's telling us the key to all of this is our heart. The heart is, and the eye are both represent our characters. Now, our true problem is that our characters have been corrupted by sin. 
Jeremiah 17 verse 9 tells us this truth when it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? So if our hearts or our characters are corrupted, what do we need? So if I have a heart or a character that's corrupted, what is it that I need, Sister Marie? Okay, I, I, saw, I saw your lips move, and I think I understood what you said, but I want to hear it. Jesus. Sorry, Jesus. Yes, that's true. And my wife said the same thing, Jesus. And she's right, and you're right. But let me ask you, what, what specifically do we need based upon this verse? The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? So if I have a wicked heart, what do I need? We need a change of heart. That's what my wife said. Absolutely. So we need a new heart. If my heart is failing and it's not pumping right, and the doctors are going to tell me that they need to do heart surgery, what are they going to tell me? They're going to say, you need a new heart. Heart. Exactly. All right, and so we have a verse in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, that really talks about this new heart that God is going to give us in the future, at least from the standpoint of Ezekiel. So turn in, uh, with me to Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. And it says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And so it's talking here is the, the, the prophet Ezekiel, God speaking through this prophet is saying that he's going to give us something new, something different, something better. In verse 27, he says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And so when we receive this new heart, it's going to change our lives. So notice that this new heart that the prophet is, prophet is speaking of is pointing forward to a time in the future. So the prophet Ezekiel is speaking to the children of Israel, and he's telling them that God wants to do something for them, but he can't do it for them right now. That new heart is not available to them right now, but he will do it in the future. Because the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? So our problem is that we have a corrupt character. We have a corrupt heart. We have a heart of stone, a heart that, that desires to do evil, right? And cannot do righteousness. How do we know, how do we know that, our, that the things that we do um, is, is not righteous? Well, the Bible also says is that our righteousness, the things that we think is good, the things that we think that we do is good, is as filthy rags. And so he needs to give us a whole new heart. So what was this pointing forward to? So we're going to go to the book of John chapter 1. And you already know that when we talked about this robe of righteousness, this is really talking about Jesus Christ. Now, I know that you already know that, but the point is, is that we need this new heart. And this new heart is going to come from Jesus. John chapter 1 verses 14 through 17 says this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and crieth, saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Now notice in verse 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So this robe of righteousness that we um, are given, this robe of righteousness that God had in the past talked about was coming, came uh, through Jesus Christ. When Jesus the Messiah came, that is the robe of righteousness that God is giving to us. Now, Jesus, in his meeting to, with Nicodemus, said this in John chapter 3, verse 3. Je Jesus answered and said unto him, talking to Nicodemus, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this new birth is how we receive the righteousness of of God in his son. And so this robe of righteousness that we receive is the righteousness 
that is in Christ Jesus, is the very life of God in his son. Um, Galatians chapter 327 says this, it says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So you think about that. When, when we accept Christ as our Savior and we're baptized in Jesus Christ, we receive the very righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Notice in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, it says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life and he that hath the Son of God hath, or hath not the Son of God, hath not life. And so, my friends, the two questions that we, we wanted to answer here is, one, what is this robe of righteousness? And we found out that it's a righteous character. We found that we, when our, our first parents had sinned against God, they had lost faith in the word of God, and they, they um, transgressed his law and hearkened unto Satan, they had lost their righteous character. And then when Adam and Eve had their first child, they could only give unto their children that which they had, and it was not a holy and a righteous character. But they had a character that was tainted by sin. Now, granted, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve, uh, it wasn't uh, as manifested as it is today as mature as it is today, but nonetheless, it was a heart that was corrupted by sin. It was a heart that was prone to sin and death. But God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This salvation that we have, this everlasting life, is uh, part of that salvation is a righteous character, giving us something that we didn't have before, giving us um, something that we could not attain of ourselves. You know, sometimes, you know, when we, we read the Bible and we, um, you know, we, we say, okay, I've got to do better, okay? We fall into sin or we do things that don't please God and we say, you know what, I've got to do better. And so we try, okay, maybe if I look unto Jesus and I try to emulate him, I can do better. And so we, of our own strength, try to do better. We try to, um, you know, resist sin and temptation, only to fail in the end. Why? Because we haven't gone to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that we have no righteousness within ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. In um, in our um, in our um, opening text in Isaiah chapter sixty one verse ten, it says, "I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for my soul shall be joyful in my God." And notice this: He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation and with the robe of righteousness. And so this robe of righteousness comes as we put on Jesus Christ. You know, I, for a long time growing up and even into my adult years studying uh, the Bible, I didn't uh, quite understand what um, uh, the, um, what, you know, putting on the whole armor of God meant. And when you go through it, it's, it's very symbolic about, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. It talks about the helmet of salvation. It talks about the, the foot gear that we're, you know, that's, uh, you know, talking about the gospel and you know, sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. All of those things, you know, that um, that it was speak spoken of there. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't recognize it for what it is. You know, I thought, okay, it's it's okay. I have to have righteousness. I have to have faith. I have to have uh, the sword of the spirit. All of these things. When in reality, all of those things are when we put on Christ, we have all of those things. We have the helmet of salvation. Okay, um, we have the breastplate of righteousness because Christ is living within us. We have the the the, the shield of faith because uh, we have the faith of Jesus. All of that is putting on Christ. 
And so when, when you know, just to sum it up here, is that the, the two questions that we asked was one, what is the robe of righteousness? It's a righteous character. How do we get that righteous character? It's by putting on Jesus Christ. Very simple. A friend of mine, Chris Conker, used to tell me, he says, you know, Wes, salvation has to be so simple that even the simplest among us can understand it. And my friends, that is the simple thing that it, it's, it's so simple, is that we need the righteousness of Christ. That's it. There's nothing more. It's like all of the other good things that come from it, the, the worshiping on the seventh day Sabbath, um, the, the, um, the, the not lying, um, the, the not, um, you know, the treating our, our parents good, the honoring of God, all of that comes as we put on Christ. Now, granted, when we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we still make mistakes. But um, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the life that we have lived in sin, we have developed a lot of bad habits. I have, you have, we all have. And we all struggle with these bad habits. But if we have put on Christ, we have the power now within us through Christ to now change the direction of our lives. And that's what God does. That's what he does through his son. That is, when Christ is living within us, we will then little by little start to shed and overcome these temptations that Satan brings upon us. Because as Christ overcame, so can we overcome through him. And so God works out the, our tempers. He works out the, um, the things that we, when we watch, that we shouldn't watch. He works out um, the... Um, you know, every facet of our life begins to change. And it is he that is responsible for our right, uh, for our salvation and our character development. Let me just open in my Bible here to the book of John. And it's, like I said, it's another one of my very favorite texts in John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, 24 tells me that we have a present reality it says in John 5, 24, he says, Verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and notice this, and believeth on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. But notice this, but is, present tense, passed from death unto life. And so what this is telling us here is that our salvation is solely dependent upon one thing. It's not dependent upon our good works. It's dependent upon Christ living within us. When Christ lives within us, then we become the light of the world. When we go downtown, we shine forth the beauty of God's character that he's developing in us. It's the, the, the motivation to help someone does not come from you. It comes from Christ. As we surrender to that, you know, to Christ within us, we will then do the good works of Christ and help others. You know, God, can, uh, God is up in heaven. Of course, Jesus is in heaven and he's with us by his spirit. But how he loves people is through you and me. That's the purpose of our life, is to love others. And that's why when he said, ye are the light of the world, right? So when Christ is living within us, then there's this air of righteousness that goes before the whole world. Now, we are not where God wants us to be quite yet, but he is working with us to get to that point. You know how I know that? Is because in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, uh, and verse... Um, 12, it says, here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so what happens is, is that the, the light of God's uh, love is shining forth in his people. Because in, um, in the first part of that chapter, chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, um, 
talking about the 144,000. It says, it says of this in verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And notice this in verse 5. This is the end result that God wants for you and me. And this is the end result of the people that are going to give this message to the world. It is in verse 5 and says, In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And so what it means is, is that their heart is pure. Now, I've used this verse a lot, and my wife has used it from time to time. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And we notice that the problem that we have is that we have a corrupt heart. And what we need is a new heart. So when we accept Christ as our Savior, as we all have, we have received this new heart. And um, what will come out of that will be the light of God's love. There will be no guile found in our mouth, no deceit in our mouth. We will share the love of God with everyone that God brings us into contact with, even though they may not be very lovable. So my friends, the robe of Christ's righteousness is offered to all that would receive it. It is not something that we have to work for, nor is there anything that we can do within, in and of ourselves to produce it. It is the holy, righteous character of God given to us by his son. And so the only question that we um, have to ask ourselves is, have we received Jesus Christ in our hearts today? And I know all of us here today have received Jesus Christ. So if you have received Jesus into your heart today, this is what Jesus is telling you to do. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. My friends, that is the beauty of the robe of righteousness that we don't deserve, we can't produce, we can't emulate. It is only as Christ is living within us that it will produce those fruits, love. We're going to love our fellow brothers and sisters. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, temperance. All of those beautiful things come from Christ living within us. Let your light so shine before men, my brothers and sisters. Love those who come into your sphere of influence today. My friends, that is our message today. So I'm going to, um, we're going to sing our, um, our closing hymn. So let me share my screen and uh, we'll sing our closing hymn and then we'll uh, close with a word of prayer. Our song we're going to sing is All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. You know, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, this song will ring true in our hearts. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious, oh, how blessed to call him mine, oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, he He is more than life to me.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing you've given us here today. Father, we thank you for the blessing of your Son to come and to unite humanity with divinity, to live a perfect life and to give that perfect life to us, that righteous robe of righteousness that he offers to each and every one of us. Father, I pray that as we have accepted your son as our savior, as Christ is working in every one of our hearts here today, I pray that we will let our light so shine before men, that we will love everyone that we come into contact with, Father, that we will share your love with them, helping, you, helping them in any way that you see fit and desire for us to do. Father, we look forward to the time when we can, without a veil, be in your presence, Lord, that we can see you face to face. What a blessing that is that you have offered to, to all of us. Lord, we don't deserve it, but because of your love, we have it, and we, we trust in your word, and we trust in your name. Let our light so shine before men that they may come into a knowledge and to contact with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.